My name is Pete Wedderburn and I'm a vet in practice. I'm going to be joined today by John Bowen, Behavioural Consultant from the Royal Veterinary College, and Sarah Endersby, Senior Technical Advisor for SEVA. We're here at the Wheelhouse Veterinary Centre. The aim of today's video is to show you how to support your clients and their pets in practice through stressful times using today's resources, technology and information. We're going to start off by discussing the importance of general health care and we'll then go on to discuss the signs of fear and stress in animals and what owners can do to minimise the impact of these issues on their pets. We'll be showing you what resources are available to you, including adaptive pheromones, a sound sensitivity questionnaire, and we'll be giving you a practical demonstration of setting up a cosy den for your pet, including interactive toys. These coming months are an important time of year for fear and stress in pets. There's a bit of an extended fireworks season these days, starting with Halloween and Guy Fawkes, going on to Christmas and other holiday celebrations, and finally on to New Year. So it's probably best to plan for several months of fireworks activity. When assessing an animal's likelihood to be stressed, it's important to review their general health care, including vaccinations, worming and flea control. If there are issues leading to poor health, an animal is more likely to be susceptible to the emotional and psychological trauma of fear and stress associated with fireworks. Animals sometimes bolt in panic at the sound of fireworks and after fireworks displays there's often a surge of lost and found pets the next day. So ideally you should have a combination of a clearly visible identity tag around your pet's collar and as well as that a microchip in the scruff of the neck and to be really safe double check that your details are properly recorded on a well-recognised database so that if your pet does go missing, they'll be promptly returned to you. One message that we really want to get across this year is the importance of recognising the early signs of stress and fear in pets. In dogs, this can include yawning, swallowing, um, going off their food, licking their lips. All these things suggest a dog is beginning to feel anxious and that's the time to intervene rather than waiting until there's a full-blown hysteria. Cats are less affected by sound phobia than dogs, but fireworks still have an impact on them. In particular, it makes sense to keep cats indoors at times of fireworks. But if you're going to keep a cat indoors, you have to take certain steps to make sure that they don't feel stressed by the change in their routine. First of all, you should use a fellow air diffuser and you should plug it in for a few weeks before it's needed. So plug it in when your cat is still coming and going as normal. That way they'll get used to the scent of the pheromone and they'll be more calm and relaxed when you do finally keep them indoors more. Secondly, making sure they have plenty of litter trays. We normally advise one litter tray per cat plus one extra one. Third, make sure they've got plenty of food and water so that they're not feeling stressed because of hunger or thirst. And last, you need to make sure that they've got plenty to do to occupy their, their time and their attention. That means, for example, having plenty of interactive toys to play with them. And it also means designing your home in a cat-friendly way, making sure that they've got areas where they can climb, where they can sit up at a height, looking down on the room. And basically, you need to see your home from a cat's perspective so that you know that they'll be happy to spend more time there. As well as making sure that your cat is microchipped, you should double check to make sure that your details are properly recorded on a well-recognised database in case they do go missing. So we're here today to talk about the whole issue of um, fear and stress in pets, especially around loud noises like fireworks. One of the new things that's come up, John, is this sound sensitivity questionnaire. Can you explain a bit more about that? Um, yeah, sure. It's um, a questionnaire that I developed with Jaume Facho in Spain um, about two years ago. We went to a series of analyses to find out which specific questions enabled us to distinguish between dogs that were mildly fearful of fireworks, dog, dogs that were moderately fearful of fireworks, and then the dogs that we'd really considered to be phobic. And we've developed a questionnaire which is only about 16 questions long, takes about two to three minutes to complete, 
and it automatically gives the owner um, an interpretation of their dog's behaviour so they can then seek help. So does it just work for the owner or is there some sort of, is it a tool that vets can use as well? It's definitely useful for vets because one of the main issues we face in general practice is we have many clients come to us around firework night looking for help but it's difficult to know which ones need medication for their dogs and which animals just need some kind of um, management solution or behavioural therapy and the advantage with the questionnaire is it enables vets to see immediately which are the most problematic cases that might need the highest level of, um, of help and treatment so they can target them. It will give a score um, for each of three different parts of the scale and the vet can then look at those scores and make a determination of which of the various different treatment options are most important. And probably the most critical part of it is that if dogs show very severe signs, such as vomiting or defecation or urination during fireworks, then it immediately alerts the vet that these are very severe cases they need to handle quite, um, quite seriously. Okay. You said there was three parts to it. What do you mean by that? What are the three parts? It gives three scores. One is behavioural signs of stress. That's things like pacing, panting, agitation, um, restlessness. Another one is coping strategy. So we know that some dogs, when they hear loud noises, will freeze, adopt a very low body posture and make numerous attempts to hide, whereas other dogs will bark and run around and try to kind of fend off the thing that they're frightened of. And we found that dogs that show the hiding, repeated attempts to hide, low body posture, tend to get worse over time. And then we have physical signs of stress, which are things like vomiting, urination and defecation. So each, score, each, sorry, each dog will get a score for each of those three components of the test. And that enables us to interpret how severe their problem is and also whether they have a coping strategy in place. They know where to hide and they feel comfortable when they're exposed to loud noises. So the sound sensitivity questionnaire is um, available online, um, where can we find it and what's it look like? If you go to the Adapter website you'll find the um, link to um, the questionnaire. It's all on one page, it takes less than a couple of minutes to complete. Um, there's about a dozen questions which are part of the assessment and when people get to the end they can enter their email address and it will email them a full copy of the report. Otherwise when they put, press the submit button it comes up with an interpretation of their dog's behaviour. So it gives them the scores for each of the different parts of the test and also tells them whether their dog is mildly, moderately or severely affected. What sort of recommendations do you make then for the different categories of severity? What sort of things do you say? Well, some dogs will obviously score zero, in which case we wouldn't expect them to be um, needing any kind of treatment. For dogs that are mildly affected, um, those are the ones that would score between one and four for the behavioural signs of stress. We think those dogs are able to cope if they're given a good hiding place and maybe an adaptal diffuser to um, enable them to find somewhere better to go um, to get away from the loud noises. The dogs that are in the moderate category, they score between five and 14 on the scale for behavioural signs of stress. They probably need some behavioural therapy, something like desensitisation and counter-conditioning, adaptal diffuser, hiding place and maybe even some short-term anxiety reducing medication to get them through a firework event. And the dogs which are severely affected, scoring 15 or more, they may well need long-term medication. They certainly need all of those other things as well. Okay. And when do you think people should um, fill out the questionnaire? Should they wait until the fireworks start or should they do it some months before or when's the best time to do it? I think the biggest challenge we have is trying to um, get clients to complete this well ahead. I can remember when I was in general practice we'd often have this horrendous rush in the last few days before firework night and we know there's a limit to what we can actually do. So ideally if they can complete it a month or two ahead then they can set up the hiding place they can start using Adaptil, they can start using any short-term anxiety reducing medication and maybe even start behavioural therapy well in advance of the season. That means they'll be well prepared for it. As a vet in practice, one of the things that can be frustrating is the length of time it takes to, um, to do a behavioural consultation. By the time you listen to all the, the answers to your questions and write them all down, it takes ages. So it seems to me like this um, online questionnaire could be a, a time-saving device. Would that be right? Yeah, I think probably the most important thing is that when you have clients bringing their dogs in or they're coming in for help uh, around firework night, you're firstly inundated with different people. You don't know which dogs have what kind of problems. 
but it's very clear that some of them are very severely affected and others are much more mildly affected. So there's a temptation just to try and provide some sort of general advice and the likelihood is that that's not going to be very well tailor-made. So it's better to get them to complete something like the online questionnaire because then it's very time-saving. Within um, a, a couple of minutes of, of reading the output from it, you can get an idea of how severe the problem is and therefore you can tailor your treatments to that particular case. And if you have, I don't know, 100 people coming in over a three-day period, if 10 or 12% of them have dogs that are phobic, which is what we think the general percentage is, that means that you can, you can maybe redirect those people quickly to a half-hour appointment the following day where you can spend a bit more time with them and therefore dedicate the service to them whilst providing people with much lower levels of problems with the more generic kind of advice. And if you're being really innovative, you could perhaps have it set up, set up on an iPad, you could hand the client in the waiting room, perhaps with your email address at the bottom, so they complete the questionnaire and it gets emailed to you straight away. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, a very good idea. You can see it's very easy to complete on an iPad. It displays very well. Um, so this, I think, cuts down the amount of time that you need to spend on a particular case. If you find that there's a, a very severe problem, then that maybe means you can devote a little bit of extra time at that moment. Um, and so I think it, it really streamlines giving behavioural advice. So what have you learnt from the previous thousands of people that have, have done it? Well, we found that this severe group we can actually characterise now as phobic. Okay. So these are dogs that show a lot of anticipation before a firework event happens. They're sensitive to even very low levels of noise. They react very intensely and they typically take two or more hours to settle down after an event has passed. And this fits with what we would think of as being a, a, an example of what phobia would be in a dog as opposed to phobia in a human being. What would your advice be for an owner if they found that their dog fitted into that category? Well, this is really a kind of severe behavioural problem. Um, for these animals, it often affects their quality of life quite severely. They may well not want to go for walks, they may be frightened of going out after dark or when there are smoky smells in the atmosphere that they associate with fireworks. So their lives can be quite severely affected and as a result we think of this as being something like a medical problem that really ought to be seen by a vet. There can be physical reasons why dogs show increases in anxiety and fears and phobias. So it's really a first call to your vet. Are there any drug therapies that are available for these patients? Well, the only licensed preparation in the UK at the moment is um, Celgene, um, the chemical um, Celegiline. Um, that's licensed for the treatment of um, behavioural problems that have an emotional origin, and that includes things like fears and phobias. Um, it works particularly well in dogs that show this very inhibited behaviour where they're phobic and they don't want to go out or they won't go into the garden or they spend a lot of time hiding. It can increase their confidence and increase their coping behaviours. So in general that's the drug that I would recommend for those kinds of cases but it's something that needs to be very very carefully assessed because we're going to be putting a dog onto medication potentially for several months and if we choose the wrong one then we may not provide the kind of benefits the owner is expecting. Yeah. And should people go to their normal general practice vet or should they go to a behaviourist for this sort of thing and if so how would they find a behaviourist? I think that the best route if you're dealing with dogs that have actual phobia problems the, definitely the best first call is the vet. They may already have the expertise to be able to help you or they may know a veterinary behaviourist that can um, assist with medication. If it's one of the more mildly or moderately affected dogs then there are behaviourists, particularly through the APBC, who may be very good at dealing with those kinds of problems and the behavioural um, treatments that the dogs require. What's APBC? What's that? That's the Association of Pet Behaviour Counsellors. All right, and they have a good website I suppose. Yeah, they've got a good website and, and and in general, they're probably one of the first calls for referrals by most vets. Has there been any follow-up to the sound sensitivity scale that you do? Is it, can you just do it once or can you...? Well, we've had a population of people that have repeated it so that they could see whether what they were doing at firework season had worked. And we have around 200 people um, from the first batch, which was early on um, last season, who um, reported what things they did and which things they felt were most effective. And we looked at the score before the season and the score after the season, and it's very clear that certain things were most beneficial. So the number one thing on the list was providing a hiding place. So giving the dog somewhere that it could go reliably to get away from um, stress and away from the noises really helped. The next thing that was very important was um, blocking out external stimuli. So pulling the curtains, shutting the windows, turning up the radio so that um, there was a background noise that blocked out the um, noises from outside. 
And then the next things that were very important were um, installing um, a dactyl. So using an adactyl diffuser in the hiding place or giving the dog an adactyl collar to wear. And in general, it looks like having an adactyl diffuser is probably more beneficial, but maybe the combination is, is, is good as well. All these tips and, and advice we've got just for that specific fireworks night, is it something we can employ at any other time of the year or is it just fireworks? Yeah, well I live in Brighton and it appears that you can use fireworks to celebrate almost any event in Brighton, so birthdays, um, all sorts of different things. So that time of year we used to think of as maybe being two weekends of fireworks, now it's really turning into a month and then we also have New Year's. So these ideas really apply at any time of year. One of the critical things that's also important when deciding how to treat dogs is even if they may have only moderate to, to mild reactions to loud noises, if they're being exposed on an almost daily basis, maybe they live near to a firing range for example, then those dogs probably need more help than those dogs who maybe react to the same level but only encounter noises two or three times a year. But these ideas apply to all dogs that are frightened of loud noises at any time when they're going to be exposed to a loud noise, even if it's thunder. If you were having um, an event in your home that you knew might be noisy and stressful, like a big party at Halloween or something, are there any specific steps you should take other than the general things that we've talked about? I think it's very much the same as, as we are. Um, you might really enjoy the party, but probably at some point you start to feel a bit tired and maybe you go off and um, stand in the kitchen and have a cup of coffee and relax for a few minutes. Being able to get away from things and, and, and relax is really important to coping with excitement and stress. So the first thing would be to make sure the dog has somewhere where it can go to, to avoid all those stresses, the noise, the activity, the people, and have a bit of a recharge. And if dogs maybe don't do that spontaneously, it's a good idea to give them a time out period on their own with something nice to eat, um, a chew or something to relax and completely get rid of those stresses before they come back and join people again. I suppose also making sure they're kind of tired by giving them plenty of exercise earlier in the day, is that a helpful thing as well? Yeah, definitely, and certainly on firework nights we recommend people get their dog out, give them a good run, let them go to the toilet well before it goes dark, so that then they're not desperate to go to the loo or desperate for exercise and expecting to do things uh, in the early evening. And that's certainly something that's very beneficial if you're expecting to have a party or some kind of activity that maybe would slightly distress the dog. Are there any other messages that you'd like to give out about important aspects of sound phobias, what people can do to prevent them, for example? I think that's actually one of the most interesting areas. Um, back in 2005, Bristol did a survey looking at um, sound phobias in dogs. They found about 49% of dogs were um, frightened of loud noises, about 80% of those were frightened of fireworks. They didn't find many um, things that showed a preventative effect, except that dogs that were born in the autumn period tended not to develop sound fears. So it looks like early exposure had a preventative effect. And they've done a follow-up study this year looking at the preventative effect of sound exposure in puppies. And they found that there was a sevenfold decrease in the incidence of sound phobias and fears in dogs that were exposed as little as once for 15 minutes during their um, socialisation period to loud noises of fireworks on a recording. So we'd also say that if we expose puppies to a wide range of noises it probably makes them more robust and less likely to develop problems later. So how, how do you get a wide range of noises to expose them to? Well um, there are obviously things like radio and TV programmes mm -hmm. um, allowing puppies when they're being reared in that very very critical period between three and seven weeks that if they're exposed to radio and TV noises they'll probably hear a lot of typical things that would happen around them but then maybe playing a, um, a recording of fireworks you can buy these online through iTunes for example just playing that for a few minutes um, every couple of days during the first period of the puppy's development the likelihood is that that puppy will become toughened against developing a noise phobia problem. Right that's very really useful. Is, is there a sort of an additive effect, as in if you reduce the general stress in the dog in the ways we've been talking about, does that mean it's, the dog is less likely to get spooked by fireworks? Is there, is there an argument that that could be the case? Well certainly stress is additive. I think it's, we've all had this kind of experience in our lives that if you're stressed at work, stressed at home, then it doesn't take very much to push you over the edge. And um, for animals it's very similar. If they have a, a, a quite high level of underlying stress due to environmental factors, then 
maybe only a small amount of additional stress from a noise is actually enough to cause them to become much worse. So using products that can generally reduce stress levels and generally reduce anxiety is going to be beneficial, and particularly in the animal's home where it needs to feel safe. So something like a dactyl diffusers or a collar would be very useful for reducing underlying stress effects. Do products like um, a dactyl have an effect in preventing a noise phobia starting in the first place, or should they just be kept for um, sort of treatment use when an animal's having a problem? I think there's a, a very important point about the development of puppies, which is that in the wild, wolf and um, dog puppies would normally be in the presence of their mother for a long period during development, and part of that environment is the pheromone signals from their mother and the other members of their group. And when we rear puppies, we do something slightly unusual, which is taking them away from their mum at 8 to 12 weeks of age. So my view is that products like Adaptil form quite an important part of that weaning process, that when puppies are taken away from their mother, it's sensible for them to wear an Adaptil collar or have an Adaptil diffuser in their environment, so that they can then be moved on into a normal adult environment with the support of those pheromones. They also, also are helpful, aren't they, when stray dogs go to... Uh, rescued animals go to new homes helps them with that sort of transition so I suppose they reduce the overall level of stress generally any time an animal is likely to feel stressed there may be a role. Yeah I think that probably the original function of this particular kind of pheromone is exactly what you're describing which is a transition period so puppies would normally be going from being very close to their mother and very dependent on her to becoming more and more outgoing and bonding with the rest of the group and investigating their environment. So that's the most critical transition that any dog would normally go through. So products like Adaptil can help with that process and then we can use it in other situations like a house move or if the dog is separated from the owners for a period or the owners go on holiday to a new location with the dog, then something like Adaptil can help with those kinds of adaptive processes as well. And Sarah, can you tell us a bit more about the ingredients of Adaptil? I mean, where does the pheromone come from and what is it exactly? Pheromone is released um, naturally from a mother when a couple of days after she's given birth and it's biology is clever and it's released from the area the puppies are going to spend a lot of time, so it's the area of the mammary glands. Um, and it's just released from the skin um, to per pervade the area around them. So where they're spending a lot of time feeding is where, where the pheromone is. Um, and Adaptil is just simply a synthetic copy of that natural pheromone um, to provide the same effect as, as the pheromone the mother would naturally be releasing herself. Does it have a scent of any kind to dogs even? Are they aware? Do they... Do we know? Do they sort of go, oh, there's a pheromone, or is it, does it work on a subconscious level for them? No, they do detect, and if you actually look at a dog um, that's detecting pheromones, they do have a response. Um, it's slightly more um, difficult to notice than, than other animals that are detecting pheromones. So, for example, male horses, when they're detecting the pheromone released by a female, it's very, very obvious, and we actually have used that in the past to be able to detect when mares are, are in season and to, to serve them. Um, but for dogs, it's a little bit more subtle. Um, and there's usually a lapping, a sniffing of the air when they're actually in getting the pheromone in, in for them to detect it. Um, but if you look and, and watch, you can actually see them detecting it. And are there any early warning signs that they should look for? This year, there will be um, a population of dogs that have never experienced firework night before they'll be less than a year old and their owners will have no idea whether their dogs are going to react badly or not. And for those dogs, it's very difficult to predict, but there are things that you could use to, um, to maybe um, anticipate whether there's gonna be a problem. Things like if the dog shows um, a reaction shying away from traffic, or is easily startled when you drop something on the floor, or if you knock something over, then the dog tends to jump. Those are indications that that dog is already sound sensitive and it's more likely to have a problem when there are real firework noises. So for those dogs, it's very important to pick up on that and make the same kind of preparations for them as you would for a dog that you know definitely has a problem. I think for a lot of dogs that show very mild reactions to loud noises, um, the normal kind of exposure they get from the typical sorts of distant, relatively quiet firework parties that happen in a typical urban area probably aren't going to generate a problem. The real difficulties arise for those well-adapted, well-socialised dogs when they're exposed to very, very loud noises. So one thing that practices probably ought to do is to keep some sort of record of where the major fire event, firework events are going to be in the area 
and then have that as a warning tone is to say well you live very close to the field where they're going to have a big firework display it might be a good idea to take your dog somewhere else on that night or maybe we need to make some additional preparations because those single events can be enough to take even a very well socialised and very robust dog and convert it into a dog that started to develop fears. So probably exposure is the main thing to be concerned about. John, what would you advise we do if we have uh, more than one dog in our household? So maybe one that is very worried about fireworks but others that aren't quite so concerned. The biggest issue is if you've got several dogs, all of whom are really frightened and need a hiding place. That may mean you need to provide more than one place for them to hide because otherwise you can see competition. And I've seen some dogs get into quite nasty fights trying to get into the same hiding place because they're both frightened of the same thing. And then the other thing is just being cautious not to offer too much sympathy to the dog that's actually frightened because you may find that you recruit the other dogs to join in and try and become part of this attention seeking episode. What about if I have a dog and a cat in my house? I mean, in general there should be very little conflict there. As long as the cat and the dog don't have some other underlying problems with each other there shouldn't be any issue because they're unlikely to seek out the same kinds of hiding places. The difficulties you might have is if the cat is very easily spooked and the dog tends to chase the cat then you might need to keep them separate from each other to avoid the cat being um, pursued around the house whilst it's frightened. But in general I don't think there's any particular conflict. You would provide the same um, hiding opportunities and isolation from external stimuli for the dog which will benefit both of the animals. What happens over years um, with animals, with dogs, with this particular problem? Do they generally stay phobic year after year after year, or do they generally improve if they get the right approach? I mean, is it something that can be cured, or if they're bad at, say, three years of age, do they stay bad for their whole lives? I think the first thing to, to think about is where does this problem come from? And probably it's a combination of genetics and a lack of early experience with loud noises. So the evidence is that certainly early exposure can help to, to prevent this problem. So there's probably a certain element of it being temperament and a certain element of it being experience. Then you add on top of that bad experiences. And for some individual people and dogs, one or two very bad experiences transforms their life and they may never really truly regain the level of normal confidence you'd expect. The evidence is also that very few dogs that are genuinely phobic ever get better over time without treatment. So in the Bristol study they were looking at dogs with fear and only 4% of those dogs that had a fear of loud noises got better over time or had got better. Even with quite strong interventions? No, this is dogs without any intervention. Right. So if you do something, yes you can treat these dogs. So you can desensitise them to loud noises, you can counter condition them, you can use medication to reduce their fearfulness. Those things have all been shown to work, but I think one of the problems we have is that very often owners think that these problems will get better spontaneously, and the evidence we have is that generally they don't. But what about with treatment, what sort of percentage of dogs, if you like, get better, so you can relax and not yeah, worry about it anymore? I, th I would say that probably if you have a dog that's severely phobic, the best you're ever going to get to is a dog that's mildly fearful. So it's very unlikely that you're going to transfer, transform a phobic dog into a dog that's now totally robust around loud noises. So typically with cases after they've been treated, and these may be dogs that were reacting to um, the sounds of doors slamming, cars backfiring, fireworks, thunder, gunshots, all sorts of different loud noises, and we desensitise them to the point where they, in general, on a daily basis, don't react to, to any noises, but if they're exposed to a very loud noise event, like a, a very close by firework noise, they probably still react. And they may not react as severely, but in those cases, typically we want to have something like a memory blocking drug as an extra safety net, just in case there is a very bad loud noise exposure. So we might use it to block out that one individual event that happened over the course of a year. So as perhaps you could make a comparison with a severely atopic dog. The dog is not likely to be completely cured, yeah. but you can manage it well so that the signs aren't bothering anybody. Yeah, exactly. So what we're aiming for is the dog's quality of life isn't impacted by the phobia. And as far as possible, the dog appears to live a normal quality of life. Mm. With one slight reservation, which is that dogs that have developed phobias are more likely to redevelop, and redevelop the same problems again if they're exposed to very, very loud noise events. So it's just something, once we treat them, we might need to be a little bit more cautious with them because there's probably an underlying problem that we can't really remove. 
Can I ask a bit of an oddball question, maybe? Mm. Do people ever put earplugs in dogs' ears to stop them hearing loud noises? Yeah, I think we used to do this quite a lot. And I can remember one of the methods was to uh, make a cone out of um, a cotton wool, soak it in water, and then kind of plug the dog's ears up with it. The problem I always felt with that is that if you think about the, the sensations of a firework um, sound, actually quite a lot of it is that kind of booming which it's, penetrates it's, the walls and your whole, body, body, yeah, your whole body vibrates. So yeah. when I've seen people use that, I've never found it to be that effective. And there may be another issue with it, which is that um, when, what dogs are most frightened of are things that they can't localise. So if the dog hears something, can see where the noise is coming from and therefore move in the opposite direction. That gives them a sense of control. If they hear a noise and they don't know where it's coming from, where would they go to hide? And unfortunately, it's the low frequency reverberations which are very hard to localise. So in some ways, maybe blocking out the higher frequencies, which is what you're doing with an earplug, isn't necessarily that great. So I wouldn't say people shouldn't try it, but personally, I've never found it to be as, as beneficial as, as, as it probably ought to be, theoretically. John, is it ever possible in a situation um, being phobic and worried about fireworks that a dog could become aggressive? Um, yeah, there, there are a small number of dogs that show aggression problems when they're frightened in this way. It's usually because the owners have interfered with their coping behaviour. So I'll give you an example. Um, some years ago I had a, a dog whose um, owners had tried to, get, tried to stop him going to his hiding place. And the reason was because his hiding place was behind their brand new 40-inch plasma television set. So um, the, the gentleman in question would stand in front of the, t of the TV and try to fend the dog away from it. Um, the dog got more and more agitated until he jumped over the TV set and got into the corner. And because the owner dragged him out, from that day on, every time there were loud noises, the dog would run in front of the TV and guard the location behind the TV, try to bite the owner and then jump behind the television set. So usually it's related to owners interfering with coping behaviour. I've not known of any dogs that just generally become aggressive when they're in, in that state. They've usually got much better things to think about than, than um, dealing with their owners. They're more concerned with self-preservation and it's only when you interfere with that that you can end up with problems. So if, if anybody did unfortunately find themselves in that situation, what would you advise? I think this is one of those times where there's nothing you can do in terms of self-help. I think that's the time when owners really must get in touch with their vet urgently because these dogs are clearly very distressed and also very determined and it's a recipe for somebody getting quite badly hurt. So the advice I would generally give people is do not interfere with your dog's coping behaviour. Try to provide it with somewhere that it wants to hide and don't try to deter it if it wants to go into a particular corner unless that's dangerous for the animal. And if you do see any signs of aggression, then the first thing is get in touch with your vet. With treating um, the, the dogs that are affected, are we expecting them to be sedated, to be completely knocked out um, that evening when we've got the fireworks happening? I think traditionally people always used to use sedatives that would um, effectively just make the dog sleepy for most of the evening. And unfortunately that doesn't necessarily make them any less anxious. You can feel sedated but um, still feel anxious and fearful. So these days we tend to try to find ways that reduce anxiety and fear. That might mean using short-term um, medications like alprazolam, which don't produce any um, clear signs of sedation when they're dosed at the correct level. So with a drug like that, for example, we do a couple of trial doses to find the level which makes the dog a little bit less um, um, active, much less anxious, but doesn't sedate them. And that's the dose we'd give maybe 20 to 40 minutes before fireworks start on a, on a typical evening. Um, and products like Adaptil don't produce that kind of sedation effect anyway. Ideally, we want the dogs to be fully mobile, fully alert, able to make decisions about where they go to hide so that they feel able to cope. And we know that coping makes dogs feel better than not coping. So if they can find somewhere to hide, go there and feel calm, that typically makes them much more toughened and robust to future noise events. I think that's one of the challenges in practice, is that when owners are used to giving their dog a tablet that seems to make them completely zonked out. Mm. When they're zonked out, they may be feeling stressy inside, but externally they look like they're very relaxed. And when we use these more modern techniques, sometimes people kind of long for the, the knockout tablet. Yeah. So 
What do you say to people like that? How do you persuade them? Yeah, I think it is just a question of client education to say, well, um, you've got to kind of imagine how you would feel if you were in that circumstance, if you were frightened of spiders, say, and somebody sedated you and left you in a room with a spider. You might be finding it very difficult to escape, but you'd feel absolutely terrified. And so it's probably good to draw analogies like that with clients and say, well, what we want is for your dog to be happy and comfortable, and there's no need for them to, to be sedated. I think with smaller dogs, Sedation was always regarded as not being a big deal, but when you've got something like a Great Dane, having a Great Dane that's ataxic, can't move around and keeps falling asleep, and uh, um, this is a major problem. Mm -hmm. And I've seen dogs in that kind of state fall downstairs or get trapped in the garden because they've collapsed when they've gone to the toilet. So there isn't really any advantage to that kind of treatment. And in general, we find that owners adapt really well to using short-term anxiety-reducing drugs like alprazolam um, as a substitute for the older tranquilizers. Isn't there an effect on memory or learning to do with alprazolam type drugs as well? Can you explain that? Yeah, there are two um, types of uh, benzodiazepine drugs. There's the old typical ones like diazepam, which is a, a typical benzodiazepine. That's Valium. Yeah, exactly. And there's a newer type of drug, which is called a triazolo benzodiazepine, and that's one um, like alprazolam. And the difference between them is that there's a much wider therapeutic um, range for alprazolam, so you can give it at much higher doses before you see sedation, and it's much less likely to produce ataxia. But the other benefit is it causes what's called retrograde and anterograde amnesia. So if you have I to explain that one now. If I gave you a dose of, of diazepam now, you wouldn't really recollect the emotional aspects of what happened over the next two to three hours after you'd taken it but it wouldn't affect your memory of what happened before. If you take um, alprazolam, it blocks your memory of events that have happened in the short period before you took the medication, maybe up to an hour. We don't know before exactly- Before you took the medication. Yeah, so this is why we call it retrograde amnesia. So it means that if this afternoon's uh, webinar was particularly horrific and stressful for you, you can take your dose of alprazolam and you won't remember any of it tomorrow. Um, and in dogs this is great because it means that if they do have a really bad experience, they're out on a walk, they hear some noises, they panic, they don't return to normal behaviour within two to three minutes, that might be an event that's going to become maybe associated with the park, associated with walks, maybe make the dog reluctant to go out. If when we go home we give them a small dose of alprazolam, they won't remember that event clearly the following day. They'll go back to that location, they won't remember how anxious they felt. So it can be very good as a safety net during the fireworks season to block out memories of events that would otherwise be very traumatic. And does it also block out memory going forwards? It does, it has both effects. What's quite interesting about um, the effect is that it only affects the, the emotional part of memory. So if a person took it, they would remember all of the events that were going on during an incident, but they wouldn't remember clearly the emotions they felt. So if you took it when you were having your birthday party, you'd remember being given a cake, you'd remember how many candles there were and how good the presents were, but you probably wouldn't remember the strong emotional connection, the, the, the real sort of feelings of joy that you had. So it has the effect to dampen down memories of emotions. It doesn't make any difference on the day so if you took it, if a dog was given it, um, say this afternoon, in the evening, if it went back to the location where it had this horrible experience, it would still remember it. It's after a period of sleep, when normally memories are consolidated from short-term to long-term memory, that's when this link is broken, and the following day the dog won't remember those events as clearly. So it sounds like our is a really, really useful product for the fireworks season. Is there a licensed version of it yet? This is the problem. It's not licensed for use in dogs and therefore we're using it outside of, uh, of a license. We need to be very aware of Cascade. And for vets, we also need to be aware that um, all of these benzodiazepine drugs are potentially drugs of abuse. So we need to be aware of which clients we're giving them to. And certainly I would advise vets not to advertise too widely which kinds of drugs they're giving out for firework night because then you might start to attract not quite the right kind of attention. Spoken a lot about dogs, does this apply to cats too? This scoring system doesn't. I think probably the general um, comment to be made about cats is that in most cases they cope better with um, fears than dogs do because they return to their main core territory in their house and they just don't go out. The real crises happen 
when cats are outside in the evening, there are fireworks that are not expected. It spooks them and it makes them run out of their normal territory boundaries. That means they can get lost or they can get run over. Mm. So the general advice I would give people is keep your cats in after dark during periods when there are fireworks. Um, maybe provide them with a litter tray and make sure they've got all of their creature comforts at home. Um, you can use things like Feli Way as a background to help reduce anxiety and distress. But in most cases, it's a question of giving the cat um, some additional security and making sure they don't get into trouble. I think people tend to um, lump together pheromone products, mm -hmm. Adaptil and Feloway, but they're quite different, Sarah, aren't they? What's, what's, how does the, um, the feline equivalent of the pheromone, where does it come from and how is it different to the dog one? You're right, uh, Pete, it's very, very different in the fact that um, the message you are, we're um, using when we're talking about Feloway is from a cat to itself. So when a cat is um, in its core territory, as, as John mentioned, um, they've all been rubbing their face um, against object, objects that are within the home. Um, and it's this message that they're leaving to themselves, so this is, this is where I feel safe and secure. So whereas Adaptor is, is a copy of the natural pheromone released by the dog, by the way, again, it's just an, a synthetic copy of this natural pheromone a cat will leave in their core territory where they feel safe and secure. Territory as is so important to cats um, that any changes that are happening, including being shut in for the evening because of the fireworks, could make them feel less happy. So therefore having the fellow way there for them, as well as all the other things, to make a cat feel happy, a hiding spot, um, potentially nice and high up, is where they feel happiest, so let them be there. One of the other things that I think is important is for a lot of owners, they don't come home from work until after it's dark. So for them, maybe keeping the cat in, in the evening, they're only getting home at six or seven o'clock at night when fireworks have already started. So there is a solution which is to use something like an electronic cat trap that allows you the ability to set um, for the cat to only come in at a particular time of day. So that means they can come in and then not get out again um, after dark. And that's maybe a way for owners that aren't around in the early evening to manage their cats a little bit better. And that takes us on to that other subject, which is microchips. Because you get cat flaps now that are microchip coded, aren't they? Mm. So they just let your cat in mm -hmm. and no other cats. But also the importance of wearing or having a microchip implanted if a cat is one of those unfortunate ones that does bolt and, and vanish on you. Yeah, and I think one of the problems is that because cats are very um, tied to their territory, even going a few hundred metres off territory because they've been spooked, sometimes that makes it very difficult for them to get back. They may have to cross a busy road which they're frightened of, or they may have to go through the garden belonging to a neighbour with a dog. Sometimes it can take several days for cats to actually work out how to get back onto their territory. Um, and obviously at any point during that time they might be um, picked up as a stray and the best way for them to be identified is using one of these um, microchips. Okay. One of the issues I've come across is people who, um, whose cats aren't used to being kept indoors. So what can you do in a situation like that? Yeah, I think the temptation is to think that the, that the cat should be allowed to do what it wants, you know, allow it to follow its natural instincts. The problem with that is that most likely the cat's going to get outside, discover that the noises are, are really terrifying and then bolt somewhere. So in general, although it may be slightly stressful for the cat to be inside, that's a safer place in the, in the long run than being allowed to go outside. Um, I have actually dealt with some cases of dogs who have tried to escape from the house and what's quite interesting with them is they get outside, then they hear the noises are louder and they bolt back in. Mm -hmm. And so I think with dogs, they seem to orientate themselves quite well. They break out the window, but then they realise it's horrible and come back. But I think with cats, the danger is they're more likely to bolt and run off. And I think it's a, a, a risky thing to give them the freedom to, to make the mistake, really. Maybe instead you should focus on getting them used to being confined indoors for short periods. Yeah. Leading up to the fireworks season. And also make sure they have the right setup inside the cat-friendly home type situation so that you know that they've got places they can go where they'll feel comfortable and secure and they won't feel this sort of sense of panic. Yeah, and I think that, that actually generally raises an issue, which is the longer you intervene before the firework event, the more options you've got available to you. So exactly as you say, if you've got a cat that generally doesn't spend a lot of time indoors and gets quite upset when it's confined, then making some changes then, before you've got the added stress of having loud noises, means that you can judge whether you've got the situation right or not. And if the cat's got used to being inside for a couple of hours in the early evening, after dark, for a, f for a few weeks or a couple of weeks, then the chances are by firework night it'll be reasonably well adapted. Mm. I think the other issue is multi-cat households. 
in multi-cat households, there may often be um, a limited number of places for the cats to climb and hide and settle. And the cats will kind of share them when they're in a reasonably normal state of stress. But if you've got a multi-cat household and there aren't quite enough places for the cats to choose from, then it could, could cause a lot of tension. So again, trying to make sure there's a multitude of choices so the cats really can choose to hide somewhere or sit somewhere and not have to conflict with other cats to find a space. Are there any good online resources to help people make their homes more cat friendly? Well, for a number of years, um, the Feline Advisory Bureau has provided a lot of advice on how to create a cat-friendly home, and they've recently changed their um, website and their, um, their um, charity name to International Cat Care. So if you go to their website, they have a lot of resources which help to explain how to keep multi-cat households, how to keep cats happy. One of the other subjects that's come up is um, when you have a dog and a cat in a house and using the two types of pheromones, would they clash with each other in some way or do they work together or how does it go? It's absolutely fine to have both products working together in, in the same room. Probably you want them in separate plugs just because the, the diffusers are producing heat in order to have the pheromone into the room but it's absolutely fine to have them together because Fellaway is only going to affect your cat and Adapto is only going to affect your dog. Can an adaptor collar be left on a dog while it's been shampooed? It won't, it won't work while it's wet and also there's a potential problem with the, the chemicals within the shampoo actually affecting the pheromone. So I'd always recommend people to take off the collar before they have the shampoo um, and get wet. And then once they're dry, um, to pop the collar back on. People will know there's going to be a fireworks event. Should they feed their dog and cat or should they save the food for later on? What do you think is the best approach? Well the biggest risk for cats and dogs is that they're going to be outside during darkness when the likelihood of firework events has increased. So generally we advise people to feed their dogs late afternoon but before it goes dark so there's plenty of time to take them out and let them go to the toilet outside before darkness um, sets in. That way there's less chance of being caught outside when the firework goes off. Is there any other benefit from being from a dog having a full tummy? There may be, uh, and certainly after um, feeding dogs often a, a bit more relaxed and maybe a little bit more playful. Um, there's some indication that giving um, high carbohydrate meals may help some dogs to feel more sleepy and more relaxed. So there may be some advantage, but I think the main thing is really just to make sure that the, the animal's settled in, has got what it needs for the evening and has had the chance to go to the toilet and have a bit of exercise and get everything over and done with before darkness sets in. I've heard about people um, that have decided it's a good idea to show their pets some fireworks to stop it having a fear of fireworks. Do you, do you think that's a good idea? In general I would say no, um, because the most likely thing is the dog is going to be frightened by the fireworks and I've regularly seen people taking their dogs to um, firework events and you usually find them flattened on the ground in terror within a few minutes. The likelihood is they're going to develop a worsening firework fear over time. Probably the bigger concern are people that have dogs that are already fearful and they've been given advice like don't let your dog hide and make him face up to the fireworks who then think it's a good idea to take them into the garden and make them watch the fireworks. That's very likely to make the dogs a lot worse. So in general we'd say minimise exposure rather than deliberately trying to toughen dogs by putting them in front of fireworks. So it seems to me, John, that the big new thing this year is this sound sensitivity questionnaire. It's very innovative and if lots of folks start to use it around the country, it's going to produce some really interesting results for you. Yeah, we have a few thousand people that have already completed it, but we would like as many people to complete this as possible, not only because it helps us with research, but also because if they can do this as early as possible in the season before fireworks have really kicked off, then they have the best opportunity to make a den and prepare for um, the event and keep their dogs safe during fireworks. So we see this as a very good tool for helping people to make these changes well in advance. Well, John and Sarah, thanks very much for taking part in this discussion. I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that the folk watching this will also have learned too. Thank you. My three top tips for supporting your pet through the stress of this time of year are first of all, include plenty of exercise every day. For a dog that means walking them perhaps half an hour morning and evening away from fireworks time and for cats that means spending time playing with them using new and different toys every day. If you burn up energy with exercise and play you're going to end up with a pet that's more relaxed and more ready to rest. Second, 
make sure you use plenty of interactive toys for dogs when they're left on their own. Things like Kongs, stuffed with food and perhaps deep frozen. The third tip is the importance of using pheromones and a combination of an adaptive collar as well as that use a plug-in diffuser so the area around the dog's bed is filled with the scent of pheromones and that's going to help a pet feel even more relaxed. I've got three top tips for firework night. The first is for vets. I'd say the most important thing is getting clients to complete the online questionnaire well ahead of the firework season so that you can really understand which dogs need the most help and prepare for those um, firework events well in advance. The second tip would be for the owners of dogs. That's to produce a den for them. So dogs cope much better with loud noises when they've got somewhere that they feel comfortable and safe to go and hide. And you need to prepare one of those well in advance of firework night so the dog fully understands exactly where it should go to hide. And we know from studies in the past that this is something which is effective in reducing stress for dogs. The last tip is to reduce the exposure of dogs to loud noises and firework flashes on the night. Keep the um, windows closed, keep the curtains closed, try to increase noise levels in the house by turning on music or keeping the TV turned up loud, just to try and mask the external noises that are coming into the house. That should enable the animal to cope better because it won't hear quite so many of the loud noise events. My top three tips for how to cope with the fireworks season. The first one is to be prepared, so to make sure you're taking your dog for a walk earlier on in the evening so that they can be inside and they don't need to go out to the loo when the fireworks are starting. And that includes your cats too, making sure that they're inside, the cat flaps are shut, windows are shut and they can't get out. My next two are combined and that involves using um, a den with some pheromone support from a dactyl very close by. I know John has recommended using a, a den too, um, so I think we should go and have a look to see how we can build a den. So if we look at this room to see where the best place is to build a den, we need to think about where the fireworks are going to be happening, and that's outside. So we need to be as far away as possible from the windows to outside, um, and make it in a nice quiet corner of the room. And in this room, the best place is over in this corner here. Now you'll notice there's a door next door um, with the glass panes in, so it's not ideal, but we could that evening cover it over with a blanket um, to try and mask some of the firework lights and sounds. And also it's the room where the family's going to be during the night, and they're probably hopefully going to be listening to the television as well to keep down the noise of the fireworks outside. Dogs, when they're frightened about something, will seek somewhere to go that they feel safe and secure. So we want to make sure the den is provided for them, which they know is the place that they're going to be safe and secure in. So we need to get them used to it um, earlier on before fireworks start. So we're going to use a puppy crate for this, just to make it nice and enclosed. It doesn't have to be a puppy crate. It can be where, whatever um, is appropriate for what you have um, and where the space is. It can just be, if it's behind a sofa, just draping over lots of blankets over there to make it more enclosed and dark and, and quiet and comfortable for them. So we're going to use Stanley's bed, because that's what he's used to, and it smells of him when he's used to it. But also we're going to then add some blankets over the top to make it nice and dark and secure um, but also to help muffle out some of the sounds of the fireworks. So then we want to leave the door open so that he knows that it's, he can get in and out whenever is, is um, necessary um, and feel, just feel safe and secure that that's their spot and they're, they're okay in there. And to help your dog get used to using the den you can always use the adaptor spray also. So all you need to do is just add some sprays to the bedding and then leave 15 minutes before you um, introduce your dog to the den just to let any um, smells from the alcohol evaporate away. So we've built the den and we've made that nice and comfortable for your dog um, but what else do we need to think about on the night? The first important thing to do is make sure we've taken our dog for a walk earlier on in the evening before it gets dark and there's any chance of any fireworks going off. So we need to make sure all the doors are shut and the windows, and any cat flaps that you have to make sure your cats stay inside with you, and then we need to shut the curtains. So we've shut the curtains in this room, but we've also got a glass door. So what we're going to do is cover it over with a sheet to muffle any of the sights and sounds of the fireworks.
So we've already sprayed the bed with Adapto, as you've seen, um, but to also to help your dog get used to using the space, you can use some treats and play toys um, in there. And also, I'm going to use today a chew toy. So we've been out for a walk, we shut the doors and curtains um, and we've got Stanley quite happy in his den. So all that we need to do now is spend some time with Stanley during the fireworks and sit and listen to some nice music. We know that using Adaptil helps dogs with cope with worrying or challenging situations, which fireworks nights can be. So plugging in an Adaptil diffuser a couple of weeks beforehand, very close to the den, helps them have that pheromone support. And Adaptil is just a synthetic copy of the natural pheromone. A mother will release two to three days after giving birth to her puppies. And the idea is that these puppies then are comforted and supported by her presence. And Adaptil has exactly the same effect on our adult dogs as well as puppies that you may have in your home. Stanley's got on an Adaptil collar, which you can see here. So it's just another way of supplying the Adaptil pheromone. And all you need to do is fit it around his neck so it's nice and snug, so it's close to the skin, so that it warms up and releases the pheromone around him. And it works just the same way as the Adaptil diffuser was, but it just is providing Adaptil support on your dog all the time that he's wearing it. So ideally, before fireworks comes, um, a couple of weeks beforehand, pop an Adaptil collar on and it's doing the job for you as well as an Adaptil diffuser would. It's best to use the adaptal collar or diffuser a couple of weeks before fireworks is expected to happen because it gives a chance for the pheromone to help your dog relax and be more able to cope with fireworks when it occurs. However, if it's getting closer to fireworks night and you haven't been able to start using them, then don't worry, you can still use the collar and that takes half an hour or so to warm up and start releasing the pheromone or you can use the spray directly onto your bedding just making sure you're leaving 15 minutes between spraying the bedding um, and having your dog go there in the den. We've talked a lot about how to help your dogs on fireworks night but as mentioned earlier don't forget cats. Once they've come in for the evening shut that cat flap and make sure they've got all the things they need inside. A litter tray, some food, some water, and most importantly, they'll have their favorite spot that they like to hide or sleep in. And it's best just often to leave them there because they cope so much better on their own. If you have more than one cat, you may find that this changing routine can be quite stressful for them. And in this situation, Fellaway can really help them cope with the changing routine and having to share the space inside with each other. Thanks for listening. I hope this has really helped you to understand how we can help our dogs and cats during the fireworks season. And I want to wish you a happy and safe fireworks season. If you want to have any further information, please look at the Adaptor or Fellaway websites where there's a wealth of information waiting for you. So that brings this video to a close. Many thanks to everybody at the Wheelhouse Stepney Centre for their help in allowing us to use their facilities today. Thanks to my colleagues John and Sarah for their very helpful professional advice. And thanks to you for watching this and for hopefully learning something more about fireworks phobia. If you make sure that you fill in the associated questionnaire and return it to us, we'll make sure you get your CPD certificate and your SQP points. And I'll talk to you again another time.